Okay, so thank you again for being here. Um, my name is Rainy Konagaya. I presented uh, two slots earlier, and this time I will talk about the supercomputer simulations which our group has conducted about our, our new reaction principle. And my talk this time is titled Supercomputer Simulation and Experiment Cl Clarifying the Maximum Level of Focusing Compression Due to Pulse Super multi Colliding in Weak Cold Fusion Engine Fusing. So this will be a repetition of what I said before. But we have previously proposed a new principle for generating reactions, which is called focusing compression due to cold super multi colliding for fast chemical reaction and weak cold fusion engine. So in this principle, multiple high-speed gas jets are injected from the sidewalls, colliding at a singular point at the center of the reaction chamber, causing fast chemical and weak nuclear reactions. This new reaction principle will achieve high compression ratio around the collision point, leading to fast chemical reactions of hydrogen and oxygen, and weak cold fusion of hydrogen or deuterium plus palladium, high power and high efficiency, while maintaining relatively silent combustion due to reactions at the chamber center far from the solid wall. And also there will be no heat loss at the chamber wall due to encasing of the reacted, reacted gas around the chamber center, increasing heat resistance. So currently we are thinking of two basic scenarios for this engine to be used in a weak cold fusion engine. The first type is single focusing collision of H2 or D2 and palladium injected into atmospheric chamber. And the second type of scenario we are thinking is single focusing collision of H2 or D2 and palladium injected in initially heated chamber of about 1,500 K. So we did some simulation, three-dimensional simulations using a supercomputer. And first I'll talk about the simulation model we used in its evaluation. First, there, these are governing equations we use. The three-dimensional and steady compressible <coughs> Navier Stokes equation using the substantial derivative. These are momentum, energy, mass conservation laws, and also this state equation. And these are computation domains. We computed the area within surrounded by the red lines which shows the computation domain, the experimental visualization window, which, when, which we can take pictures after the collision of jets, the reaction chamber, and the end of the side passages, or the passage for the jets to collide up the middle of the chamber. The number of grid points we use is about 41 million. And the computations are conducted for same geometry and same conditions as shock tube experiments, which I explain later. And also the boundary condition downstream is given by the Thompson non-reflection condition, otherwise known as the method of one. So next, this is details on the experiment device we used to measure the pressure increase near the closing point of jets. We used about the nine meter long shock tube in order to generate high speed jet flow having a strong shock wave. In the low pressure chamber of this shock tube, we installed a device which is made of the reaction chamber in the side passages, we call them side passages, but they are passages in which the super multi jets are flowing in to collide at the center of the reaction chamber. Near the collision point of the reaction chamber, we installed a pressure sensor, which is highly responsive. It's made by Kistler Instruments. And also, in the downstream part of the compression device, there is an observation window for taking Schlieland photography, which the pictures we took, I showed in my previous presentation. So this is comparison of the flow field for computation and experiment. These three pictures, surrounded by the blue lines, are computation results. This is pressure distribution, this is streamline, and this one is computational density variation with a secondary processing based on Schlieland photography. This picture, surrounded by orange lines, is actual Schlieland photography taken by the experiment. As you can see, the position of the shock front, which can be shown here, and also the size of the upstream mushroom vortex area show good agreement between computation and experiment. I will also show a comparison of flow field for two time periods, one earlier and one later. You can see that for both time periods, the position of the shock front and also the size of the <clears throat> upstream mushroom vortex area show fairly good agreement for both time periods. 
Again, emphasis is placed on the fact that both the computational and experimental flows show axial symmetry after the super multi jets collide on the center axis, which may indicate stable compression due to collision of jets. So, next we investigated the pressure increase of jets that collide at 90 degrees, in which the side passage is made relatively thicker. And we use the same device for the combustion experiment I showed in my pre previous presentation. This photograph is taken around the reaction chamber exit. And as I told in my, present, my previous presentation, strong light due to combustion appearance can be observed. So this is in the prototype engine we use for combustion experiment. This is the same diagram I showed in my previous presentation. The 14 jets in through the intake they are made full steps by this rotary plate ball, which is installed in the middle. And a field injection device is placed downstream. And the pull steps collide at the center of the reaction chamber. The engine mount can move freely to the right and left. And a load sensor is installed in the engine mount to measure thrust in the combustion experiment. So next are experiment results. And also, this time, computation results of the pressure increase obtained near the closing point of 14 jets. As you can see, for both experiment and computation, the maximum pressure increased to over 700 kilopascal, which is approximately 18 times that of the initial chamber pressure. This high pressure increase in intake was seen for both experiment and computation. And I'd also like to say again, that experiment result was repeatedly or reliably obtained, with the maximum pressure value varying within less than 3%. We also did experiments where we felt where we vary the position of the pressure sensor. And we got similar results. And we also got results that imply the stability of the collision objects. So to summarize up to this point, a steady three-dimensional supercomputer simulations based on the CIP method and the bi scales method applied for the stochastic compressible linear slips equation and theoretical considerations show that for 14 focusing air depths colliding with pulse, induced by inner, initial outer and inner pressures of 0.31 megapascal and 0.4 megapascal with the size of BD ratio 2.7. Pressure ratio at the chamber center without reactions is about 18, which agrees with experimental value. The simulation model is valid by using lots of experimental data. As shown in the other presentation by us, which I gave earlier, chemical reaction and high thermal efficiency are possible. However, Weak nuclear reaction may be impossible because compression level may not be enough for the collision of 14 jets on the same time. For occurrence of weak cold fusion, the number of jets is increased to 26, which is under development. Half of the spherical surface of the reaction chamber is for super multi-jets, which is shown here in this pinkish color, while the other remaining half can be used for exhaust. Therefore, we'd like to point out this geometry implies an open system. So next I'll explain the first scenario type that I've explained earlier, which is single focus inclusion of hydrogen or deuterium and palladium injected into atmospheric chamber. And these are results of the supercomputer simulations. For basic scenario type one, we obtained the maximum pressure over 200 megapascal and the maximum temperature over 3000 Kelvin. And these are time histories of the pressure distribution and temperature distribution at the center of the reaction chamber. This shows the time history of the pressure and temperature at the collision point. So for the basic scenario type 1, the single focus collision of H2 or D2 in palladium injected into atmospheric chamber leads to over 200 megapascal and over 3,000 Kelvin up the, around the chamber center. However, if the compression is not enough for weak cold fusion, we next propose basic scenario type 2, which is single focus inclusion of H2 or D2 and palladium injected into initially heated chamber of about 1,500 Kelvin. And these are computation results for the next scenario. And this computation result is the single focus inclusion for a heated, initially heated chamber of 1,500 Kelvin. <clears throat> As you can see, the maximum pressure at the collision point is over 70 megapascal, whereas the maximum temperature is over 6,000 Kelvin, much higher than the scenario type one. 
And next, these are the temperature and pressure histories of the collision point. The next is a movie for the pressure distribution, I'm sorry, the temperature distribution for basic scenario type 2. Just a moment. It's loading, just a moment. <laughs> I'm sorry. So this shows a movie and the jet's collide at the center. You can, you can see a, a red spot in the center, which shows temperatures over 6,000 Kelvin. OK, so to summarize, for basic scenario type 2, which is injecting the single focusing collision of HCRD2 and palladium injected into initially heated chamber of 1,500K leads to over pressures of 15 megapascal and over 6,500 Kelvin around chamber center for occurring stable weak cold fusion. However, in order to prepare initial heat of 1,500 Kelvin, another energy source is necessary. Therefore, we next propose scenario type 3, which is a combination of basic scenario type 2 after basic scenario type 1. So these are results I previously showed. Basic scenario type 1, and as you can see, after the focusing collision of jets, the temperature near the chamber center is increased to over 1,000 Kelvin. So after this, scenario type 1, we do scenario type 2. And these are conclusions and outlook for my presentation. First, I showed basic scenario type 1, which is single focusing collision of H2 or D2 palladium injected into atmospheric chamber which leads to pressure over 200 megapascal and over 3,000 Kelvin around the chamber center. However, if the compression level is not enough for weak cold fusion, in this case, we involve type 2, single focusing collision of H2 or D2 palladium injected into heated chamber of, five, of about 1,500 Kelvin, which leads to pressure over 50 megapascal and temperature over 6,500 6, Kelvin around the chamber center for occurring stable weak cold fusion. And to order, in order to prepare initial heat of 1,500 Kelvin, another energy source is necessary. Therefore, we propose scenario type 3, which is double focusing collision of H2O2 at first stage in the injected into atmospheric chamber, and also H2D2, vapor H2O, and palladium injected at the second stage, which leads to over 50 megapascal and temperature over, over 6,000 Kelvin without another energy source for in heating initially the chamber to 1,500. The scenario type 3 is close to basic scenario type 2 added after scenario type 1. Because high temperature of vapor H2O by chemical reaction occurring after scenario 1 remains around the chamber center. Whereas high pressure region generated by scenario 1 expands very soon with sound speed, with sound speed which results in low pressure. Thus, after power by scenario 1 is extracted, Temperature 1,500 Kelvin and 0.1 megapascal is possible around the chamber center. Therefore, we can do scenario 2 after scenario type 1. So this is the same material I presented in my previous presentation. Um, this is the same <clears throat> diagram I showed in my previous presentation. I'd also like, again, I'd like to point out that the stability of the jets, this is the picture of the flow field after collision doesn't change that much, even if we add disturbance to the inflow of the jets. And also, the pressure increase near the collision point when disturbance is added is not disturbed much. Although the variation is slightly, slightly larger than without disturbance, the maximum pressure is increased to nearly the same value as without disturbance. And again, I'd like to show the five physical reasons why we think the collision of super multi jets is stable. Although um, quantitative research about the stability of these jets are still undergoing, we are thinking of numerous reasons why the collision of jets is stable. First of all is that the phenomenon may be stable by nature. When the center jet is slightly inclined to an upper angle, the upper part around the collision point becomes higher pressure resulting in a force towards the lower pressure area, resulting in the inclined jet to 
return to a horizontal angle. And the second reason, as I explained, is that this collision is mainly produced by collision of very thin spherical shock fronts generated stably and repeatedly. This is computation result just before the collision of the shock front. And I'd like to point out that this is spherical shock fronts. It's different than two-dimensional shock fronts. And also for point three, the jets coming after the shock fronts are in laminar flow because these are pulse flows which are potential flows, as is well known from fluid dynamics textbooks. And the fourth point is that, well, this is a computation result for a single jet injected into ambient pressure chamber. And you can see that before the turbulence occurs, there is a certain length where the jet flows in a straight direction. And this length is over 2.0 which is a characteristic of jets that is shown in several textbooks. On the other hand, the smallest R by D ratio shown in this research is about 1.35. Thus, the condition similar to nearly laminar streak jets will also lead to stable collision of the super multi jets. And the fifth reason is that there is less, less shear stress between the jets, because there is very little stagnant region between the neighboring jets. This fact will lead to nearly laminar flow Whereas the computation of a single high-speed jet in this picture, this is for the super multi jets and the very, very less stagnated area on the collision point of super multi jets. You can see that for the single jet, it has strong shear stress around the contact surface between the jet and the ambient air, which cannot be seen in the computation for super multi jets. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Again, thank you very much, and this papers open for discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Kanyoko, for an excellent presentation. And it's cool, and super multi jet sounds awesome. So just just on the nomenclature, it's fantastic. Um, uh, you're, you're talking about trying to raise temperature, and I believe that the raising the temperature is important. And you're looking at alternative ways to raise the temperature in the core, I guess. Um, have you considered using atomic hydrogen and, and, and producing that and immediately injecting it? Or alternatively, uh, working with uh, Dr. Roshi Namaza, who lives in Tokyo, and he, he has a gas that uh, has been analyzed by one of the universities in Tokyo, to uh, apparently, to stably store uh, a small percentage of atomic hydrogen. And then you're benefiting from the recombination 4.48 EB in the center, and he's also been able to burn um, uh, carbon dioxide with the uh, gas, and so you don't have to use palladium, which I think it's going to get expensive after a while if you're a car burning palladium. <laughs> um, and, and so there's just some points where you might be able to take this, and I can connect you if you like. And then uh, secondly, just a by the by question, um, is it based on uh, a sort of engineered uh, collapse of a cavitation bubble? Okay, so to sort out your question, um, you said, is it related to the collapse of a bubble? It, uh, are you trying to basically mm -hmm. engineer a, a collapse of, of a cavitation bubble? Yeah, good question. But we are thinking about it. Okay. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. In the automotive application? Uh, yeah, <coughs> you, you may uh, say on the cost. But uh, at first, we will uh, uh, we want to apply to the aerospace target, maybe, I don't know. But, of course, we also try to the to automotive application. Uh, first is uh, uh, combustion with uh, cooling system. Yeah, very high thermal efficiency will be able to. That's the first time. So if I well understood, you are using uh, atomic hydrogen process. So um, to make atomic hydrogen, the best material yeah. is uh, um, constant 
because it's about eight times more efficient with respect to palladium, and the cost is about 1,000 less. So I would like to suggest to explore this other material. You can make a, you can make a nano cost of time, and uh, so the problem of, of a cost will be solved easily. <laughs> just my just my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your very kind presentation. And uh, uh, from what I heard and what I understood, you showed that the 26 injector reactor is some kind of 3D structure. Okay, it's a special structure. And uh, from, as a mineral chemist, uh, zeolitic structure have been used and some palladium nanoparticles or nanoclusters have been incarcerated in the zeolitic uh, spaces, okay, cavities. Okay. So my question is, could the, the collision point that you are able to produce with this 3D, with this, uh, 3D structured reactor uh, could mimic in some way uh, the cavities of zeolitic structure, transient uh, equivalent of what can be built with zeolitic structures. This is a question. Uh, maybe the, your question is related to the uh, spatial distribution of the uh, uh, paradigm or something, maybe? It's what supply of the paradigm? To, to what I understood that uh, you use palladium nanoparticles uh, in your uh, fuel uh, reactor. And in the case of zeolitic structure, they also try to incarcerate mm -hmm. palladium clusters in zeolitic cavities. So I just make the link, but maybe it's wrong, but I just made the link between these two different approach. One is mineral approach, with a, a, a continuous presence of palladium clusters in a, a mineral cavity that some people mm -hmm. succeed to build in these cavities, uh, and a new approach, which is, to my point of view, but maybe I'm wrong, uh, a, a, a quite different approach where there is a, a collision point, and at that point, I guess that there is palladium nanoparticles that are also uh, uh, expressing some kind of uh, what you call cold fusion reaction. Yeah. Uh, so is there a link between these two fields? Differently, but uh, I work for Nissan Motor Company uh, during uh, uh, 10 years. And uh, at that time, the uh, liquid fuel particles distribution we optimize. So the, uh, I have uh, many uh, know-how to control, optimize, to optimize the fuel distribution, particle distribution. So of course we have uh, uh, numerical code, original numerical code to evaluate uh, particle distributions. So uh, we, uh, good question, we, uh, we are trying to uh, optimize the distribution of uh, particles. Okay. Give the last question of the session to Dr. Hill Mora. Nice presentation from Cornelia. Uh, I have a question. Uh, why uh, did you add nitrogen gas to use cold fusion. Uh, what is this? Okay. Um, the reason why we, we wrote in many slides mm -hmm. nitrogen may be added is mm -hmm. because we haven't, um, the computations we showed in this presentation is for the collision of air. And we haven't done it oh. for collision of hydrogen, okay. which is undergoing mm -hmm. right now. Okay. Yeah, that's why. Just, why yeah, that's why. Okay. And uh, another reason is uh, safety, for safety. Uh-huh. Yeah. For yeah. safety, you add. I'm afraid of the okay. big, Big energy occurrence. Okay. Yeah, so we want to control uh, mm -hmm. by changing the uh, N2 ratio. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank all the speakers this morning.